<laughs> See, I have a haircut at uh, over near Notre Dame at like 11:30. I'm like, you know, I, I said an alarm on my phone. I was like, you know, I gotta get out of here by then. I'm um, sure mom's delighted about that too. Yeah, no, I was gonna say like I I woke up this morning. I was like, you know, I I need to do something about my hair. I was like, you know, I'm glad I scheduled this appointment. Um, my mom's actually going out of town today to Florida, so it'll be nice when she comes back. She'll be a little, <laughs> she'll have a more presentable looking son. Welcome back to another episode of the Chips and Chops podcast. We would like to first shout out our amazing sponsor, Stockroom East. Stockroom East is an intentional creative community space in South Bend that exists for co-working and, co-working and events. Today we are with the legendary Chuck Freebie. Chuck is Michiana made, and for the last 35 years, he's been covering sports and news around the Michiana area. Chuck graduated from Elkhart Central High School and then the University of Notre Dame. From 1987 until 2003, Chuck was a sportscaster at WNDU, where he created new franchises for the sports department, including Chuck's Challenge, Friday Night Flights, and Round Ball Roundup. For the last 20 years, Chuck has been the uh, sports director for Family Broadcasting Corporation, where he has done play-by-play of high school and college sports, including football, basketball, baseball, and soccer. While Chuck is known around this area for his sports coverage, he's avidly in- involved in charity. Chuck involves giving back to the community by volunteering with several local charities. So Mr. Freebie, Dave and I are, were seniors at Adams High School and are passionate about media and storytelling. Looking back at your childhood when you were our age, when did you realize that your dream was to become a sports personality? Honestly, probably when I was about seven years old. Now, I really? don't know if you're familiar with the name Howard Cosell at all. Mm. Howard Cosell was a broadcaster for ABC, and he got to do basically everything. He did football, baseball, the Olympics, boxing. If it was a big event, Howard Cosell was at it. And look, I realized early on when I couldn't hit the wiffle ball over the fence of my backyard (laughs) uh, that I wasn't going to be a major league baseball player. Yeah. But I love sports. And so I thought, gosh, this guy gets to go to everything. They pay him to be at everything. How can I do this? And so that's kind of when I get the bug of wanting to be a sportscaster. And my brother and sister were much older than me, so they were out of the house by the time I was about five. Huh. So I spent a lot of time talking to myself, which yeah. is a great you know preparation for radio because... <laughs> yeah, you talk to your, you talk in a room by yourself. Yeah, exactly. So so you would say, uh, say if your teacher and, you know, when you're younger, your teacher asks you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I, even at seven years old, you were like, I want to be... I want to be on the news. I want to be covering sports. I want to be a sportscaster. That's incredible. You were born with the voice to have it because, you know, there's a big thing about the voice and you have a great voice for Is it something that you've practiced? Because it definitely seems like uh, newscasters have, you know, a distinct voice. I think what you try to do is make sure that your voice is the same when you're doing this as when you're out in public so that people don't say, oh, he he sounds like this. (laughs) And then he gets on the air and he sounds like this. Um, So, yeah, I mean, you again, you talk to yourself a lot. To where it just develops. To where it just, I think it becomes your voice. Yeah. When was your first gig with sportscasting? My first sportscasting gig? Well, sportscasting on an actual radio station. So I had done the public address down at the Little League Park basically from about the age of 12. And one of the coaches in that league was a radio broadcaster in Elkhart by the name of Jack Jack Laurie. And so he said, hey, I'm doing the Indiana-Kentucky All-Star game down in Indianapolis. My regular stats guy isn't going to be there. You want to come along? I said, sure. And I'm wearing the headset. I'm listening to him. I'm just thinking I'm keeping the stats. And we come out of a break at halftime, and he says, and here with the halftime stats is Charlie Freebie. And, okay, this is news to me, but, you know, we yeah. we just, I did it so the way I had heard it. You kind of became a color commentator then, or? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't adding any color other than okay. reading the stats, but... Uh, that was my that was my first time on radio. In the beginning, was it like you had really bad nerves? Because I could imagine if you're going to be on radio for the first time, I would be nervous. Even doing our first podcast, I was pretty nervous. I, you do get nervous. I still get a little nervous before a game, but I think that's showing that you care. Yeah, right? Cause and you're a little yeah. excited too. Yeah, you know, you're, you, I'll be excited tomorrow for some ice state. Yeah, yeah, and I'll be fired up and ready to go. But I think. Nervous from the standpoint of, I'm going to fail at this? No, not that kind of nervous. 
the the time I was the most nervous of I'm going to fail at this was before my first TV sports cast at WNDU when I anchored the first time. Okay. That was probably the biggest fear of failure that I had because it was the night of a Notre Dame IU basketball game. Ooh. Which we had on our air. Uh-huh. And back then, Notre Dame was pretty good at basketball, <laughs> yeah. right? Right. And so was IU. Yeah. So you had a big audience. And I'm running around at the last minute, you know, trying to get stuff cut. And I'm sure I was panting a little bit while I was on the air. Yeah. So after you graduated from Notre Dame, you became a sportscaster, I mean, for WNDU. Can you take us through some of your favorite, like, moments and stories from your early years in sportscasting? One of my favorite moments. Well, first of all, the stories that you get to tell. So one of the first stories that I got to tell, the reason I was hired at WNDU was because Jeff Jeffers and Jack Nolan were so into Notre Dame that nobody was really covering the high school stuff. Mm -hmm. So they wanted me to cover high school. And I encountered a a quarterback for Jimtown, 1987, by the name of Jeff Adams, who was playing through non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hmm. And just telling that story. And that... That sticks out with me because it's really the first kind of feature story that I really got a chance to tell. And and trying to flesh that out, and you're trying to put it into a minute 20, minute 30. Yeah. Tell the story. Tug at emotions a little bit, obviously, which is natural with that kind of story. And so that sticks out to me. The chance to cover... Uh, Harold Brazier. Harold Brazier was a boxer from South Bend. Hmm. I believe he was a welterweight. And he had the opportunity to fight for world titles. Wow. And I got to go out to Las Vegas and cover his championship fight against Roger Mayweather. Have you heard of Floyd Mayweather, yeah. the boxer? Yeah. Roger Mayweather was his father. Okay. 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 Was he as highly accoladed or kind of lower? Not quite as high as Floyd, but... He was he was, he a, was, good, he was a good name. Okay. Well, he, yeah, he was a, he great was a good boxer. name. And you're out at Las Vegas. You're covering yeah. this at Caesar's Palace, and there's Don King, the promoter over there. And it was it was everything's cool. paid for. Everything's paid for. <laughs> you're out in Vegas. You're covering him. The fight ends, and you're back in the locker room, and you get exclusive access to this guy that just fought for yeah. A boxing title back when... Did he win? No, he did not. He did not. Uh, He lost on a split decision. Oh, it wasn't knockout? No, no. So he he gave it a really good go. And he would have a couple of championship fights. He fought a guy named by the by the name of Juan Koji down in Argentina one time. No, I did not go to that one. Why not? Were you offered? (laughs) No, I was not offered. Would you have taken it? Oh, yeah, yeah. You you enjoy enjoy the traveling? Argentina. Yeah, especially at that time. Yeah. Now travel's not, not nearly as fun. As, as fun. You've been where you wanted to go? Not everywhere. Not everywhere. I, I'd love to go to some other places. If somebody said to me, uh, the Cubs are playing in another World Series, we want you to go cover that, that'd be uh, fine. Yeah. If somebody said to me, we want you to go to Ireland to cover the Notre Dame season opener next year, that'd be fine by me. <laughs> that'd be incredible. Uh, if somebody said to me, we want you to go cover Notre Dame in a Rose Bowl, yeah. I'd love to go to the Rose Bowl. Sometime. So it's kind of you want to travel with your job rather than just traveling to enjoy the experience, or is it kind of just an added bonus? It's it's a bonus. Okay. It's definitely a bonus when you get to travel on somebody else's dime. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for the first 15 or so years, you were with WNDU, and then in 2003, you switched to WHME TV 46. Mm-hmm. What prompted that switch? Well, there's a couple things. Number one... At WNDU, um, I was the weekend guy from about 1993 to 1998 and met my wife at WNDU. She was a producer. And then we started raising a family. And by the time we get to 1998, we have five children. And they're starting to do different things. And I'll never forget this. 1998, I dropped my son off at his t-ball game to go cover somebody else playing ball and i thought this makes no sense because you didn't get to watch your own I didn't son get to play watch my own kid yeah. because he's playing at a time that i have to be somewhere else and i went to the news director at the time and i said is there any way i can switch to day weekdays so that i can and she said there's you know two sportscasters and you're one of the two and 
Jeff's not going anywhere. He's doing weekdays. We need you to do weekends. And then I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to go somewhere. And I didn't want to leave town, so I wound up putting out some feelers, and I did some fundraising for a hospital for about five years. And I still, they, they called me back and said, hey, you know, high school football's starting up here. Can you still do that? So we agreed, we agreed to that. But then in 2003, uh, 2004 really, uh, Bob Nagel, who did the game of the week with me many years at 46 and had actually uh, mentored me through my internship when I was in college, mm-hmm. got very, very ill and had been out for about a year. And TV 46 said, we can't keep just finding substitutes to fill in. We need to find a full-time guy. Yeah, And they approached me and... Yeah, I've been there now almost twenty years. So you said you didn't want to like travel or move from South Bend. What made you feel connected to South Bend? Was it just having the kids and the yeah? My here my or? family's from Elkhart. Okay, uh, so I grew up in Elkhart. My mom and dad were there, and uh, we had roots down pretty well. I mean, you know, we got married in nineteen ninety two, so we had been here six or seven years by then, and I was comfortable here. My wife was comfortable here. If I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to have to find another sports casting job. Where else are you in a market with a, a college like Notre Dame? Yeah. And what they are able to do in football and basketball and then have access to the Bears in Chicago or the Pacers in Indianapolis or the Lions in Detroit. So Yeah. And a lot of what you do is covering high school sports. And I would say, you know, the, the 574 area has incredible athletes, especially for basketball and even for football. I'm curious, what made you cover high school instead of branching off and doing exclusively college or even you know going to the big leagues? Well, like I said, when I got hired at WND, that's really what they wanted me to focus on was high school. And believe it or not, back then in the late 80s, while there was a lot of radio coverage of high school, there wasn't nearly as much television coverage as there is today. So we started a, a little thing called Round Ball Roundup, for high school basketball season. And at the time, we were happy if we got to five or six games on a night and showed you all the scores. Yeah. And of course, it's kind of evolved from that. But the big thing back then, I think the thing that really advanced it was in, I want to say, the early 90s, we got access to a helicopter. Wow. And we did what was called Friday night flights. <laughs> and we would fly out to the football games and we would fly overhead in a helicopter and get highlights and Wait, land. When was this? Early 90s. Okay. Why was it stopped? <laughs> well, helicopters are expensive. And <laughs> yeah. That's uh, like the a, fact that they had the funding then, though. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. So uh, we, we would rent it and then eventually I think they owned it. But you got to pay for a pilot. You got to pay for storage. Yeah. You got to pay for maintenance. There's a lot of expense involved yeah, there. An and you're weighing, is that expense worth? Because yeah, there's, no prof- there's no profitability. You're not gaining any money off of it. You're just gaining the... You're gaining notoriety. It's like, yeah. yeah. So, so for football games that year, you were up in a helicopter? Oh, I, probably three or four years we were up in helicopters. So. That's incredible. I think like, yeah, it's rare that I guess even people get to experience being inside of a helicopter. And even like, I mean, I'm curious, I would be curious from the fan perspective, they're watching the game, then overhead, they see a helicopter. That would be kind of, that'd be very interesting. So the first year we did it, I go up and we're, and we're going to go cover Cassopolis at Dwajak, big Cass County rivalry. Okay. And I, you know, one of the things I had to do during the week too was find, okay, where are we going to land? Yeah. You know, what? Are we going to land at the baseball diamond or are we landing at the airport? Field or and and yeah. how, how are we getting from where we land to the football field and all these kinds of things? And I had to get coordinates for the pilot the whole bit. But I also wanted to let the coaches know, hey, we're doing this, and we really don't want to be a distraction, even though I don't see how we can help but be a distraction. Yeah. yeah. And... So I go up and I talk to the Dwajak coach and he goes, "Yeah, fine." He goes, "The airport is like two blocks from here, so we'll we'll get you. We'll have somebody waiting there in a car to bring you." I said, "Great." So then I go talk to the Cassopolis coach. Cassopolis is a huge underdog in this game. Prob- probably going to get blown out by forty points. Okay. And he's like, "Why are you covering this game?" I said, "Well, you know, it is a rivalry." He goes, "I'll tell you what. When I see the helicopter, I'm going to call a timeout." 
And he goes, I'm going to have a special plate just for you guys. I said, please, this is exactly what we don't yeah. want to have. He goes, Chuck, we're losing anyway. <laughs> we might as well have some fun. All right. So I get up there and I tell the pilot and the camera guy, and I said, you know, I don't know what he's going to do, but he's got something planned. Sure enough, he sees this and time out. They come out and they run a double reverse pass that Dewajak picks off and takes all the way the other way for the touchdown. I said, we, I said, we don't need to land. Yeah. This, this play will be what we show. I thought you were going to say they did kind of something like what the what the Chiefs do, where they do the run in a circle, oh, like, a, yeah, like they yeah, would be yeah. a helicopter, and then they roll them out and run the play. But Yeah, double reverse pass. It gets picked off, taken the other way for a touchdown. I mean, he, he got you the highlight, right? He did. I, mean, I, I, I don't – it would have been – it Not what better. he had in yeah, mind. Yeah, I was gonna but... say it would be better if like the double reverse pass worked and they end up getting a touchdown or something. I think that's that that's crazy. So, more helicopter stories if you guys yeah, are yeah, interested. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there was a a place up in Michigan called Rainbow Farms, which was very heavy into marijuana and yeah. other drug use. And the Indiana State Police went up. If you're familiar with the story out of Waco, Texas, where um, there was an FBI siege, and guys went in, and it got really ugly in Waco, Texas. And, okay. And a bunch of people died in that. When was this? Late 90s. Late 90s, okay. So shortly after that, the F, uh, the state police are sieging Rainbow Farms. And the helicopter pilot and a news crew go up there on a Friday, and they're circling, and they get shot at. By the police? By the people at Rainbow Farms. Oh. Wait, this, the people in the helicopter, it was you? In the no, helicopter? no, no. It was no. like your company? Our helicopter. Yeah. Our pilot, our camera guy, and a news reporter. <laughs> so they're up there just trying to get footage of Rainbow Farms. Rainbow Farms thinks it's the Michigan State Police because it's a blue helicopter. And they shoot at it. So they come back. Now, our helicopter pilot had been in Vietnam. Okay. So he had been shot at before. Okay. He comes down, and he lands, and they're inspecting it. And sure enough, there's a bullet hole in it. And I said, well, I guess that screws us up for Friday night. He goes, oh, no. He goes, I'll have that fixed. We'll be up. Honestly, if that happened to me, I'd probably say, you know, no more helicopter. I think we need to. <laughs> that, I mean, that that's just, that, honestly, that's kind of terrifying. It's I mean. The pilot was in Vietnam, so I understand why he wasn't terrified. The most terrifying is two weeks after 9-11 in 2001. Now, you know, remember with 9-11, they shut down a lot of air traffic. Yeah. And we didn't do – there was one game that Friday night. I did a story on it. The following week, we decide – they're playing, so we went ahead and made our flight plan. But – uh, apparently, they didn't want helicopters up yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we get up in the air. We're up maybe three, four minutes. And all of a sudden, we got two fighter jets coming right for us. And they kind of identify, they're, okay, there's a station logo on the side of the helicopter. But they basically let the pilot know, turn around, go back, and land. You guys didn't know that there was this, like, grounding, or it was like you kind of just were like, eh, we're a local news crew. We should be fine. I think that was more of the mentality. Okay. Wow. Um, So, I mean, like, a lot of what you do is covering sports, but a lot of it is also, uh, like, pointing out high schoolers' accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's something that brings you a lot of fulfillment? Because, I mean, a lot of these high school sports players don't get a lot of attention. But, you know, on the field and then through an interview, they can. Yeah, I, I hope so. That That's what we hope we are doing with anything we do, whether it's uh, the stories that we do, the things I post on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, or the game of the week. We are trying to bring recognition to young people and their accomplishments. And that's one of the reasons we focus on the Student Athlete of the Week feature that we yeah. do in our games. Again, trying to to just recognize those. And that's one of the reasons I put in the homework that I do so that when a young person goes to the free throw line, I can talk about them other than just how many points they've scored or what their free throw percentage is. Yeah. You know, you like to point out for the mom at home, 
hey, it's an honor student, or hey, they're involved in 4-H, or yeah. Yeah. hey, they play multiple sports, and things like that. And just show that we do have a lot of well-rounded young people out there in the community that that don't get the publicity on the evening news because they're not out there shooting people or stealing things. Yeah. For yeah, sure. they're making the life better for themselves through sports. And right. And, and making other people's lives better, too, yeah. and, and representing their schools well, yeah, their communities. Sure. So is that really what you feel like really kept you locked in on high school sports and not wanting to go up or... I enjoy the purity of it. When you get to the collegiate level, and I believe me, I love being on the field for Notre Dame football Saturdays. Yeah, who wouldn't? Before a big game. I mean, that that's an atmosphere unlike any other. But let's face it, especially now with NIL, this is a that's a business. Yep. That's not playing sport for the purity of sport. Yeah, which is sad. Everybody there is hoping to get to the NFL each day. Now, that's not to say that the people playing football at high schools don't have that dream of the NFL, but a lot of people playing high school football are playing just so they can hang with their buddies or feel like they can be a part of something. Yeah. It's not, and and that's fine. That's great. There's a place for that. Obviously, you get to the college level, and especially at the level of a nerd aim, and it is big business. And it just has a different feel about it. I enjoy covering it. I think it's fascinating. I know a lot of people like watching it. But I think there's just something pure and special about high school sports. And I know people will say, yeah, but there's these AAU travel teams. and There's politics in anything. But yeah. Quite frankly, it's, uh, to me, the highest level of pure amateur competition that we still have yeah sure. that's a great point because a lot of people say is like indiana for basketball for example it's like best in any of the nation and you're covering the high school basketball in indiana where it some could say originated i don't think people understand how good the coaching is at the high school level in indiana for yeah. both boys and girls a lot of these people doing it could easily transition to the college level really oh do you have any prime examples you'd want to say or well i look at penn i mean al yeah. rhodes he stayed there for has ever. won almost 700 games in his <laughs> high school career and i would put him up against plenty of college coaches now the difference is you don't you're not recruiting you know you're you're taking what you get at a school. I don't know. Now, Penn, I say, Penn well, is a little uh, iffy on the recruitment I say not recruiting rules. these days. Actually, every high school these days yeah, is every. doing some recruiting. And, like, yeah. recruiting could literally just be going to a middle school basketball game and Correct. showing your And space, it could right? just be, yes. like, oh, one of your players uh, becomes friends with one of the eighth graders and get, tells them to come. Boom. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's as simple as that. But it's not the, the national level of recruiting. Yeah. There's no money exchanging hands, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christy Ulrich, the Penn girls coach. I know she's been approached by small colleges. I mean, she's something like 310 and 50 in her 14 years. Now, obviously. Why why do you feel like they feel so connected to staying in high school? Probably a passion. Well, not just passion, but when you go to the college level, Craig Heatherly does the games with us on WHME, and he was. a college assistant coach for a long time. And he says, it's grind. It is a 12 month grind. Now I know that high school sports are becoming a 12 month grind with off season conditioning and the travel and, and things like that, but it's not the same. You get to go home to your family every night where you're not on the road. You don't have to go scout players. You don't have to go recruit players. You're not on the road. Quite frankly, Kissing the hiney of an 18-year-old guy trying to get him to come yeah. to school, yeah. right? You know, yeah. that I can see where that would get worrisome yeah. after some time. For sure. So last June, you were inducted into the St. Joe Valley chapter of Indiana Football Hall of Fame. A big part of your job is, like we said, pointing out athletes' accomplishments for their specific sport. And it's really just all about the athlete. Can you take us through what it was like having your accomplishment appreciated like that? 
the best part about that was my son giving the introductory speech for me because that that was a special night because of that. And it's nice to be recognized by the people that you're covering and, and them showing their appreciation. But as I said in my acceptance speech, you know, when there's a parade, St. Patrick's Day, there's a huge parade, yeah. right? What good is a parade if there aren't people to stand by the side of the road and cheer it as it goes by? And that's my job. My job is not to be the person in the parade. Yeah, yours. My job is to be the person kind of acknowledging it and telling you about it as it goes by. So I'm not in the Indiana Football Hall of Fame for anything I've done on a football field. I haven't tackled a guy. I, yeah. Now, as I pointed out, I have not fumbled a ball, thrown an interception, or lost a game either as a coach. Yep. Uh, yep. But, <laughs> undefeated. Yes. But all that said, it's it's because the people in the sport appreciated what I did to cover the sport. So that, for me, is acknowledgement enough. So the more acknowledgement and more fulfillment came from having your family there. Oh, yes. Boosting you up and whatnot. And, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and you guys will learn this as you get older and have kids, but anytime... You know, my kids are all college age now. My yeah. youngest is a junior at Purdue. Mm -hmm. We have six kids. They're scattered to the four winds of America. Anytime we get all six of them in the same place, it just that brings, is a yeah. rarity. So the fact that all six of them and my daughter-in-law were there for me that night, that was special. Yeah, yes. That's, yeah. that's incredible. And I mean, like Dave and I have talked to a bunch of athletes or even had athletes on the podcast, and they... Uh, for example, we had Patrick Juskal on. He, yep, he went to St. Joe, and he was like, you know, uh, if Chuck Freebie or I mean, even Redeemer Radio came to a practice, you know, he was like, I need to, I need to go talk to him. You know, I need to get on that video because they get on that video, they get to send it to their grandparents, sure. their aunts, their uncles, and then. They so get... I think, yeah, I think that's like a unique part of the season that I think athletes love is you know, being interviewed after a practice or after mm -hmm. a game. I mean, that's just. Yeah, I guess that's pretty incredible. Well, we love doing it, too. I, I love getting to meet them and getting to know them a little bit and, and learning things about them. And uh, the young man from John Glenn, Bryson Hanna, gave a yeah. great interview after the game last week with Craig. And you could tell he was just having fun with it. Yeah, because, I mean, it, he'll, he'll probably do that two, three times in his whole high school career. But the, exactly. they see the NBA players, they have a press conference every game. So they get to have that one chance, and it's like the best moment of their life. Yeah, you you can understand at that level why people get tired of it. Yeah. But at my level, I mean, and that you ask why I stay in high school. Because when I approach people with a the microphone, they're happy to see yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they approach you yes. if you have a microphone. A, 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 as opposed to in the NBA where they're, you know, running from you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's... Um, you know, with all like the charity work that you do, would you say that's something that brings you a lot of fulfillment? Yes. Um, along with your high school sports, it seems like you kind of have it figured out, right? Yeah. So in 1995, I'm doing sports at WNDU and my wife is volunteering at the Women's Care Center and she comes home one night. And she's very upset. And I said, honey, what's wrong? She goes, well, our development director is leaving and we don't have any money. And I said, well, you should be happy because if your development director knew what they were doing, uh, you'd have money. Yeah. And she said, well, if you know so much about it, why, <laughs> why don't, don't you do, do it? it? Yeah. <laughs> and as spiritually fulfilling as it can be to say that the Cubs win, uh, it, it still doesn't quite fill that spot in your heart. And to go out and to help mothers and babies uh, survive is just as fulfilling as anything I've done in my life. And to have been able to be a part of that in 28 years and see the growth of that organization. When I first started with Women's Care Center, they had three centers, two in St. Joe County, one in Marshall County. They are now the largest crisis pregnancy center in the United States of America. And they have centers. I'm going to go visit one uh, in about 10 days down in Vero Beach, Florida. They have them in Bismarck, North Dakota, and Fargo, <laughs> North Dakota. Uh, and I get to go see them and, and help them raise money in those places, too. So that's extremely fulfilling for me. Yeah. That's yeah, because, like, I mean, Cubs win. That's, like, a part-time. It's like, yeah, that's cool. It, it's a, week, a, week, a, week, a week later, they'll probably lose. But yeah, A day when, the, later. The, it's the, the Cubs. Are yeah. we getting here? <laughs> 
but like with Women's Care Center, it's it's just a lifetime of joy and fulfillment that those wins will last forever and they don't go away. You know, one of one of the greatest moments of my career was to be approached in a high school press box by a young man who said, um, my mother was a client at Women's Care Center. She said she heard about it through your newsletter that you wrote a article in. Yeah. And I am the product of her having gone there and not gone to get an abortion, but gone yeah. to uh, have him. And so and you that, got to cover that. And he came up to me in a press box and told me that. And uh, I get misty eyed just talking about it now. So you can imagine what I was like that night. And then I had to go on the air. So thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Talking, uh. talking about going on the air, I mean, with Semi State being tomorrow, what does like your day to day look like? Even on a weekday and then when it's a big Saturday basketball day. Yeah, so every morning I'm on the Pulse FM jump start from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. And then I get off of that and immediately we start working on game prep for whatever we have this week. So this week we have two games. Now, fortunately, I've done Northwood and John Glenn in the last two weeks. So there isn't a you, whole yeah, lot of covered it all to- year. So the later the year is, the easier the yeah, prep work I, is. I get the stat sheets. Talk to the coaches and the players about the keys to win. Do some features. But that's all that you have to do there. But now we have Delta and Bishop Dwinger. Well, first of all, neither one of them. I don't know anything about them. Yeah. And here's the other thing. They don't know anything about me. Yeah. I've never heard about them until now. Yeah. So how do you look at that? Is it like you reach out to them, tell them what you do, they yes. come up here, and it's that? And then – when you're announcing it, are you kind of like favoring your team, or do you I, are you good at keeping it 50-50? I don't like to do games as a homer. I mean, I okay. did Notre Dame baseball for ten years, and I think one of the things that Notre Dame didn't like about the way I did Notre Dame baseball is I didn't do it as a homer. You know, if the Irish were stinking up the joint, you would say that. I would say that. Yeah, and you know, um, so I I try to be very balanced when I do a game, and because. Okay, let's say you're a player from Delta, and years later you wind up, you know, grabbing a DVD of this game that we did. Well, you don't want to hear this guy just raving on and on about John Glenn and never saying anything about Delta. For sure. So I think it's important to to do the homework to reach out. So yeah, I sent an email to the coach. I said, "Do you have 15 minutes this week that we can do a phone call and talk about your team?" And that's what I did yesterday afternoon. And in the meantime, you get the stats, you get the roster. It's a lot easier now than when I started back yeah. in the eighties because you got Google and, and you it's can all go online, online and everything's preps. there, and and you can watch, you yeah. can see, you can actually see them play, and and see what they did. So you go through all that, and then you, um, I I usually have an eight by eleven sheet of paper in front of me with all the notes about the teams. And I can refer to that as the game goes on. And then, you know, that's the science part of it. The art part then is calling the game in such a way where you're informing and entertaining, yeah. but not intruding yeah. on the game. For sure. So, uh, like, I'm curious, why did you decide to go to John Glenn, uh, was it John Glenn Dwenger tomorrow? And then instead of going to Penn versus Hammond, because I think that's more of like a bigger game. Because there are two games in Elkhart rather than the one game at Penn. So we do John Glenn and Delta, and then we do Northwood and Bishop Dwayne. Okay. So, you know, I'm not running a 501c3. I'm running a business. Yeah. And I can get advertising from Glenn and from Northwood for those games, whereas I can only get advertising from Penn for its game. Plus, I have to pay a crew, Northside Gym, a lot closer than Michigan City is. So I'm going to pay the crew for more money to go to Michigan City for less advertising. For sure. Yeah. That yeah, actually that makes wins. a lot more sense. Because yeah. I was going to say, I'm planning on going to, the, to, the, to Michigan City how, tomorrow. I'm, I'm interested. I, how, does, how does the money work exactly? So you're, by advertising, what is the profib- profitability from it? In terms of if you're an advertiser, like, are you in the saying game, list, what are like you getting listeners? out of it? Yeah, what are you getting out of going and covering the game besides just like the self fulfillment of it? Okay, so on the monetary aspect, so are you mon- getting paid to go or are you 
Basically yeah, just not. paying your crew, you're going, and it's like voluntary. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. No, no. We, we're in this to try. We're in this for twofold. We're in this to try to show what's going on in yeah. the community. But if we can do that and make a couple of shekels for the station, we'd like to do that too. Yeah, okay. So, you know, everybody on that crew tomorrow gets paid. Yeah. The announcers, the camera guys, the guys in the production truck, the guys doing replay, everybody on that crew tomorrow gets paid. Costs money to have that truck. Costs money to maintain it. If we are showing a game, that means we're not showing something else that has advertising. For sure. So all those things add up, and you have to at least be able to cover your cost. Yeah. If not make a little bit more and that's okay. why we sell advertising in the game that's why there's commercials that's why there's the live read so let's say somebody you know last week uh casper's coin and jewelry sponsored each of the quarters and every every time we would come back from the break first quarter being brought to you by casper coin and jewelry in south bed we're not saying that just for giggles okay. we're saying that because they want to be associated with that broadcast they paid a fee to be part of that so that's why we're saying it. Their fee that they're paying is help covering our costs okay. for the broadcast. That makes sense. What what high school sport do you like covering the most? Hmm, that's a good one. Um, there is something, I think football, because it's so once a week, there is something special about the anticipation that builds up for a Friday night football game that we have lost a little bit of with basketball games on Tuesdays and Fridays and Saturdays. So basketball games feel like, oh, there's just going to be another one. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty oversaturated. Whereas football is such an event, and it is such, in many of these towns, it is such a community builder. You know, you've got the parents that come out for the team. You've got the parents that come out for the band. you got the parents that come out for the cheerleaders. Hey, we're going to have middle school night. Those people yeah. are and, and all then there's the sudden, student sections and yeah, and the student sections and and you know in in places that do it upright too, they might let you tailgate a little bit beforehand, yeah. you know obviously responsibly, but what's yeah. wrong with having a a little bit of food before the game and stuff like that and and just making it more of an event. So for me, and football because of the the pace of play. It's more of a storyteller's medium, right? I mean, it's easier, you, or is, uh, yeah, because basketball goes at such a pace. Yeah, there's no and break. and we're trying to squeeze in the live reads, and I want you know the analysts to have time. Basketball, TV sports are more of an analyst dream anyway. Yeah, because you can see what's going on. I don't have to tell you that much. I mean, my best calls are usually very limited. In what I say. Um, we did one where a guy won a game on a half-court shot. And I think I said something like, Edmonds for the win. Yeah. Ball Boom. goes through the net. Crowd support. And I'm not saying anything. No, you're not like Mike Breen hitting, hitting the... No. 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 I, I'm not. I'm letting the picture and the sound tell the story. Okay. So they they don't need me chiming in. They're, there's You can see it all unfold. Now, if I'm on radio, that's a tif totally different story. And if you ask me what my favorite sport to cover on radio is, that would be baseball. Baseball. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so we have like some follower submitted questions that I'd like to ask you. Please uh, do. The first one is, what is the best game that you've covered this year? Ooh, best game that I've covered this year. I assume we're going to talk about basketball. Uh, I would have to say... From an atmosphere standpoint, the Penn Marion game yep. over Penn. I was I was there. Yeah. I, yeah. I Joey could, sold and didn't come and well, it was it's easy. not it like was, that. So I, I helped huge. Yeah. So many people there. Well, I was gonna say as an excuse for not going, I helped coach a fifth grade basketball game and they uh, fifth fifth grade basketball team and they had a game that night. Did they like, win? They did win. Oh, yeah. okay. And they won by like twenty, so I was like, I, I, mean, I probably didn't need to be there. But I, <laughs> I got I there like, what an hour early or an hour early, the J V game and it's already yeah. full com max capacity and yeah, so from an atmosphere standpoint, that would be it. That was the best one. I'll tell you the Glenn Washington game last week, heck of a ball game. Yeah, that game um, was really. I mean, Glenn was up by ten. I feel in the fourth quarter, right, and then Washington came back and was up by one with 
30 seconds to go. Yeah. That was the game that, like, I don't know, it was a very emotional game. I mean, I was rooting for Washington. And I was just like, I was like, we got this. And I was like, oh, no, we don't. You know what I mean? It was pretty heartbreaking in the end. Sure. But, I mean, that, that was as competitive a game as we've probably done this year. For sure. What would you say is, like, the craziest game that you've ever been at in your 35 years? Ooh, we did, uh, just last year, we did the Bi-County Tournament. And, and this is going to sound like a nothing game. Argus and Bremen in the first round of the Bi County tournament, and it went four overtimes. Wow. So you're not getting paid extra for those four <laughs> overtimes. You're no. like, man, no. Come on, rest, make this but, game end. But it's it's the drama of yeah. it all and just seeing how it unfolds and everything like that. So from that standpoint, that was very exciting. Uh football wise, we did a Penn Elkhart game a couple of years ago that was decided on a two point conversion. That's fun. With uh just a couple of seconds left. That was great. Uh the Penn Mishawaka game when Mishawaka busted Penn's NIC winning yep. streak back in two thousand nine. We'll roll that out on sports classics now and then. And Before know, they transferred over to the NLC or whatever it is. Yeah. And I know Corey Yeoman at Penn hates seeing that every summer. <laughs> Uh, Bart Curtis loves seeing it every yeah. summer, uh, but that was an incredible atmosphere that night because everybody kind of had the feeling this might be it, and it was no fluke. I mean, Mission Walker went out there and, and did a number on them that night, but the atmosphere around that game was uh, tremendous, and then you go just a few weeks later, they play in the snow for a sectional championship, and uh, Mission Walker, I think, winds up winning that one by seven. For sure. Um, lastly, are you taking Penn to win the state championship this year? Well. <laughs> I know you're unbiased, so I, I'd understand right. if you can't answer that. But I, They're going to have their hands full tomorrow. I assume they beat Hammond Central in the second game, although Hammond Central is a very solid defensive team. But I think Hammond Central is susceptible to spells where they don't score a lot. And, and Penn and Marcus Burton is. He takes over the game. Yeah. But the Penn-Kokomo game, if those two play in the semi-state championship and you've got Flory Badunga of Kokomo, yeah. who is more than... Well, he's already been elected, I guess, the Gatorade basketball player of the year. He's the junior, the right? And he's only a junior. Yeah. He's like, the, I think he's like top five ranked in the country. Yes. And so you'd have him versus Burton. Mark. I mean, that that's the ticket. Right there. That yeah. Where's the semi state hosted? Is Michigan, Michigan City. City. That's okay. a good. That's, that's it was between Michigan that's City worth and whatever. Elkhart, I believe. And I'm I'm saying I'm I'm happy that it was in Michigan City. Yeah, I Michigan can, City hosts everything. I swear. <laughs> but Every now year. you you ask me if Penn wins state. How do you pick anybody in state over Ben Davis when Ben Davis is thirty and zero right now and they've already beaten Penn this year? Yeah, I think it would be. It's something that I I want to see Penn win. I think it'd be crazy if you know a South Bend. You know, I lo- think it'd local be great. Team goes and yeah, I, that's what that's what I kind of hoped with Washington. I'd be like, I mean, I think if they can beat John Glenn, maybe they can make it to state. But um, yeah, I mean, that's all we have prepared. I mean, thank you so much for you know coming on our show. I mean, this was, uh, I guess, a great way to spend our Friday morning. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you see it that way. I'm glad you said, oh, boy, this is a Friday morning wasted. I would have rather no. been in class. <laughs> <laughs> um, be in class. That's funny. Yeah, so can you tell the viewers where they can, you know, find your sports coverage and stuff like that? Sure. Um, I'm not sure when you're posting the podcast. Sunday. Sunday. Sun- okay, so we won't promote the Saturday yeah. semi-state <laughs> games. the state game. And, the- <laughs> uh, and we don't get to show the state games anymore, unfortunately. Oh, the ISA sad. has it has put together a separate deal on that. But I am happy to promote that beginning on Friday, April 14th, we will have a spring package that will air on TV 46 for seven straight weeks. And we will start with a softball game between the defending 3A state champ St. Joe Indians and the New Prairie Cougars. A couple of really good pitchers in that one. Berkeley Zakay of St. Joe, Ava Geyer from New Prairie. That might be done in an hour. Uh, the way those two Done in, Oh, because they're just strike, strike, yeah. strike, strike. <laughs> yeah, there's just <laughs> lots of swings and misses. Uh, and then the week after that, um, we do boys lacrosse. Okay. So we've got the South Bend Bears, who won a state title last year, yep. taking on Mishawaka. That'll be April 21st, and we'll go right down the line. We'll have um, two or three defending state champs on there. Penn Baseball will be on there against Marion first week of May. 
and excited that we're going to be able to cover track sectionals for the boys and regionals for the girls. So it should be a fun package to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, make sure to check that out. Those sports don't get as much appreciation as they should. Um, thank you guys for watching another episode. Check us out on literally everything. Chips and Chops podcast. All right. Thank you.